Now we will talk about the notation that we use in calculus and the meaning of the notation. And by the word notation, we just mean how we write it, the symbols that we use and how those symbols are used and what they mean. And having a good notation makes a big difference. Just like having a good vocabulary will allow you to express ideas well in a language, having a good notation for the math allows you to express the mathematical concepts well. And I, I would argue also allows you to understand them well. And we have some really good notation for the calculus that goes all the way back to the time of Newton and Leibniz. So let's look at this and put it all together in the big picture here. Okay, think back to first semester calculus. We have some function and we want to know the slope of the graph at some x value. So what we do is we take the corresponding y value at that point and then we go forward on the x-axis. So we have this interval here which we call delta x and we take the corresponding y value there and so we have this interval on the y-axis which we call delta y and the slope which is of course rise over run is just delta y over delta x and remember we're trying to find the slope at this x value so what we've done here is really just calculate the slope of this segment right here connecting these two these two points but that's a good approximation to the slope of the curve at that point which would be something like that, the slope of the tangent line right there. And it's a very good approximation if delta x is small. So the smaller we make delta x, the more accurate this is. So if we want to take the extreme case, we're trying to find the slope here at some x value. So what we do is take a tiny little interval, which, is, which we consider to be infinitely small, and we call it dx, and we take the corresponding tiny little y interval and we call that distance dy and that gives us a tiny little segment here instead of this relatively large segment right there we have this this tiny little segment right here which is in fact this little segment I've drawn in red it is in fact infinitely small and the slope then is exact the slope is dy over dx this tiny little rise divided by this tiny little run. Now let me say that some calculus teachers would not like me presenting it this way. They would say, no, you can't treat these dy and dx things as little algebraic entities in and of themselves. You need to have a limit to, to do this properly. And I would argue that you can, that you can uh, think of these dy and dx as independent variables mathematically, and that you can think of the slope here as a quotient. And um, I'll come back and defend that viewpoint a little bit later and explain a little bit about the why that's a little bit controversial. But this is what we did for semester. The slope is dy dx, and that's the slope at this point. Now what we're going to do is apply a similar reasoning involving the area under a curve. So let's draw some axes here. And imagine we have a function, and we want to know the area under the function between two points here, say A and B. We want to know the definite integral. And that's what this area is. The definite integral is the area under the graph. So you can write that in your notes if you're taking notes. The definite integral is the area under the graph. And that's what I've shaded right there. Okay, that's the definite integral from A to B. Now how can we calculate that? Okay, well one way is to take our function and these points A and B and split this split this area under here into sections and I'm going to just draw some lines here to divide this into four sections and I'm going to make them approximately even although they don't have to be and I'm going to make each of those sections into a rectangle that fits neatly underneath the curve there so something like that the area of these four rectangles added up is a pretty good approximation to the area under the curve. Now there's a little bit of error involved. You see it doesn't fit perfectly. The rectangle doesn't fit perfectly under the curve. So at the top of each rectangle we have a little bit of area here that is an error in our our approximation. But you should see that if I took this interval here, which I'm going to call delta x, 
And if I made delta x small, then these little error regions would be really small. And if I make delta x infinitely small, then the error regions are infinitely small. And this approximation to the area under the curve then becomes exact. And that looks like this. So let's draw another set of axes and put the curve on here. And we're trying to find the area under the curve from A to B. So the calculus looks like this. I'm going to make a really thin vertical strip here. And that's supposed to be perfectly straight. I'll fill it in here. And the width of that strip, the horizontal width, it's infinitely thin. We'll call that width dx. And there are an infinite number of those. I could draw a whole bunch of them. I can't draw an infinite number of them, but I draw a few to represent that. And the sum of all of those areas is the total area under the curve. So I think of my definite integral, this area, as the sum of an infinite number of infinitely small vertical strips of area. Now, I like to put all this together on one page, so bear with me for just a second. Again, if we have an interval here, delta x, and the corresponding interval delta y, then we can say the slope is delta y over delta x. And that would be the slope of that segment, and that's a good approximation to the slope of the curve at some particular x value. And instead of having a delta y and a delta x, if we have an infinitely small dy and dx, then the slope is exactly dy dx, dy over dx. And then let's put the area graphs over here. If I have a region under the graph between uh, value A and value B, and I want to find that area, I can divide it up into pieces. I'll make these rectangular, because the area of a rectangle is easy to compute. And the sum of those areas will give me the total area. And the notation from that you're familiar with from pre-calculus. The total area will be the sum, and we'll use the sum symbol. And we'll use an index. I'm just going to say i is 1 to n. n is 4 in this case, but it could be any number. And I'm going to sum these areas. So the area is going to be the height times the width. That would be the area of one of the rectangles. So the height of the rectangle is the value of the function. That's f of x. And the width of one of the rectangles is my horizontal interval. There, that's delta x. So this is an area, height times a width. That's a rectangle. And I sum them all up, all n of them. And that gives me a pretty good approximation to the area under the curve. And if I want an exact approximation, or not, not an exact approximation, but an exact value for the area. Instead of having a finite number of rectangles, like that sum represents, I have an infinite number of rectangles. And each one is this really thin rectangle. Okay. That has a width dx. And the height right there is just the value of the function. This is my function f. The height there is the value of the function. So the total area under the curve, this total area that I'm looking for, is going to be the sum. And we use this elongated s like that, the sum. And I'm going to put an a down here and a b here. And that means starting over here at a and going to b. The sum from a to b of all of these things, all of those rectangles. So what's the area of that rectangle? Well, it's the height times the width. And the height is f of x, and the width is dx. And so this is the notation that we use in calculus for a definite integral. And what it is is a sum. Just like this is a sum, this is a sum. But here, we're summing up a finite number of rectangles, height times width. Here, we're summing up an infinite number of rectangles that all have a height times a width. And the width is infinitely small. So we imagine an infinite number of infinitely small rectangles in here.
and those areas are all added together and that's what this symbol means that's an elongated s and this was Leibniz's notation s there stands for sum and just like with the derivative if we have an approximation here and then we let our in interval here become infinitely small then the approximation becomes exact the same thing happens over here we have an approximation to the area and when we let our interval become infinitely small the approximation becomes exact and this gives us the exact area under the curve and if you think of these little dy and dx values as being infinitely small that uh, gives a headache to a lot of people because that's zero and that's zero and you have zero over zero but as we see in some cases such as this zero over zero can be a, a meaningful quantity it comes out to not zero and not infinity but comes out to some finite value the slope of the curve at that point uh, the same thing happens or something similar happens over here we have a dx which is equal to zero that thing is infinitely small so this area is infinitely thin so it really has an area of zero but there are an infinite number of them so there's an infinite number of infinitely small areas so infinity times zero comes out to be a meaningful quantity it's not infinity and it's not zero it's something in between and it's in fact exactly the area under the curve and this is a really good notation for that it's worth taking note that my function here is a function of x so this is an x-axis let's put an x there and that's a function of x and my little differential quantity here is dx those need to match a function of x and dx and then these values here, those are x values. I'm going along the x-axis from A to B, and I'm adding up all the little areas, all those little infinitely thin rectangles. So what you have on screen right now is a nice summary of all, all the relevant details. Over on the left side, you have slope. Both of those diagrams on the left deal with slope. This is the pre-calculus up here and the calculus down here. This is an approximation to this and the calculus gives you the exact answer over on the right side you have two diagrams dealing with area and over here this is the pre-calculus up top and the calculus down here and the pre-calculus gives us an approximation to this the calculus gives us the exact answer and both of these the slope and the area both of those opened up entire entirely new classes of problems that could not be solved before they could only be approximated using techniques like we use in pre-calculus but with the calculus we can do these calculations and get exact answers to problems that we were not able to solve before Newton and Leibniz figured this out